The first session of the 2021 Ohio Beef Cattle Management School was hosted via Zoom by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team on January 18th. During that first session, the focus was on making quality hay for beef cattle with an emphasis on soil fertility and seed species selection. In the portion of the presentation that follows, Jason Hartshue discusses the fertilization practices that will prolong the life, quality, and productivity of hay and forage stands for beef cattle. Let's listen in as we join Jason as he begins his presentation. Wish to have in that mixed stand so that it lasts into that six to eight years that some beef producers manage to get a mixed stand to last. Um, if you're in a high production system, uh, very intensive cutting management for potentially dairy quality hay, often you manage to burn an alfalfa stand out in three or four years, but a lot of you manage to keep those stands lasting longer. No matter what your production system is, soil fertility is very important. I'm not going to really dive into how to soil sample, but soil sampling is absolutely critical. Uh, taking a good soil sample, submitting that to the lab, and then analyzing that based on what crop you plan to grow. So a grass crop tends to need a little bit lower pH. Most of our grasses do well at a pH of around 6.3 to a little bit less than that, actually all the way down to about 5.5. Our legumes, on the other hand, due to their need for a symbiotic relationship in the soil with nitrogen fixing bacteria and nodulation, clovers need a pH of about 6.5 and alfalfa needs that a little bit higher, more in that 6.8 range. Um, and actually subsoil pH can be become very critical for alfalfa. Some of our soils tend to have a very low subsoil pH, uh, but we really need that subsoil pH to be greater than six to have a strong alfalfa stand. Um, if it's not greater than six, we'll see low rooting and root damage and we don't get a stronger growth. Phosphorus grasses need that phosphorus to have a, about 20 or 15 parts per million. Our legume crops are looking more at about 25 parts per million soil test. Um, potassium, we're looking in that range of 100 to 120 parts per million. And then if you're looking at ratios, the calcium potassium or the magnesium potassium ratio is about two to one and calcium magnesium is about a one to one relationship. There's a lot of different classes that these different nutrients fall into. So we need to understand that a little bit to understand how much our crops need. So the primary nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, those are the nutrients that we need the most of. If we're looking at a grass crop, we're going to have to supply some of that nitrogen to the crop. If we have a good mixed stand of legumes and grasses in our pastures or in our hay field, a lot of times we'll get the nitrogen we need from those legumes to feed our grass crop. If we're in a full legume stand, uh, we usually don't have to add any nitrogen. And then we have our secondary nutrients of calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Uh, two of those, calcium and magnesium, typically we don't need to add. Sometimes we'll look at adjusting them just a little bit, usually with liming uh, to adjust the pH in the soil. We'll add calcium or magnesium to the soil. Sulfur, on the other hand, we'll look at later on in this presentation. We're starting to see some need and response to sulfur applications across Ohio. There's nowhere near as much atmospheric deposition of sulfur. So by applying a sulfur application, we're actually seeing some yield and benefits. Micronutrients, zinc, magnesium, iron, copper, boron, molybdenum, chlorine. When we look at those, zinc and boron, zinc and boron are the two that we typically look at adding to forage crops. And we'll dive in a little bit on how much of those you need. Then, of course, other elements that are in those plants are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, uh, which they are getting from the atmosphere. So when we're looking at soil fertility and forage production, what we have to find is what's that limiting factor? So yields are gonna be limited by the element that's in the shortest supply in relationship to the plant's needs and making sure that we shore up that leak so that we can grow the highest yields possible. The first place we like to start is making sure we have the correct soil pH. Um, soil pH is really important that we correct that before we do the seeding, before that drill goes out or before we go out and try to frost seed a crop, we need to make sure we have pH corrected. Uh, lime takes a little bit of time to react in our soils. Um, we really on an alfalfa stand would like six to 12 months, ideally 12 months, depending how much lime you apply for that lime to react in the soil and start to move down through the soil profile. 
uh, because we really need that reaction down in the rooting zone, not just in the top inch or so. We need it to move on down into that entire eight inch profile, which takes time. So we need to make sure we look at pH and correct it before the seeding year. So where are the different ranges we need for pH and what's going on in the soils? So here at this 6.3, where we have grasses, we see we have decent amount of fungi activity, bacteria, nitrates, potassium, calcium is not quite as readily available. Um, if you're growing a corn crop, that's up about 6.5 and alfalfa, you're looking at about 6.8. Uh, you see that fungi and bacteria may be just a little bit more active up there at that 6.8. Um, sulfur, actually, we're starting to see its decreased availability up at alfalfa versus down at that 6.3 for grasses. Uh, but some of these other micronutrients, molybdenum, zinc's becoming less available the higher the pH is, copper's less available, and so is boron. But the effects of soil pH on the activity of soil microorganisms, availability, plant nutrients, and their occurrence of the toxic elements is really important. And one of the reasons we have to watch what the pH of our soil is. If we get down here really low, a pH of about five, um, that's where we actually can see increased challenges with aluminum being taken up into crops and actually having aluminum toxicity in forage. Uh, we can also get some magnesium toxicities in those really low pH soils. So one of the challenges with pH is, um, if we look at these two grasses, it's the exact same grass just grown at different pH. On your left, pH is 4.3. On the right, pH is 5.6. What is the reason for this difference in growth? It all comes down to rooting ability. If we don't have good root growth, we don't have those roots scavenging for nutrients. They're not pulling in water. We may have a decent stand early in the year when we have plenty of water, but if we go into droughty conditions, that pH of 5.6 with a lot stronger root growth is gonna survive that drought and continue to put on forage because it has roots down a foot or better into the soil where that pH of 4.3 is only maybe rooting in the top couple inches pH really can affect root growth and ability to spread. And pH throughout that rooting zone matters. Um, this here is a bean. If we look at the pH of 7.2 throughout that entire rooting zone, down 18 inches, we have roots going the entire way down. But over here where the pH is 7.2 in the topsoil and we have a change into our subsoil of a pH of 4.5, the rooting pretty much stops at that pH change. Some of that we can't control. We have different subsoils, depending on what our soil's parent material is. Um, we may not have a lot of control over that, but there's some things we can do tillage-wise and liming-wise to at least try to homogenize the top eight inches and get it the correct pH for the crop we're gonna grow up in that top rooting zone. So we look at soil pH and its effect on fertilizer efficiency. Uh, nitrogen's about 52% efficient at a pH of 5.5. 70% efficient at a pH of seven, 63 at that pH of six. So we see a lot more nutrient availability at those more neutral pHs. Um, the same thing you're gonna see with uh, phosphorus, about a pH of 5.5, only 15% efficient, 30% efficient at a pH of seven. Same thing over here with potassium because more efficient the closer to neutral we are. So back to that target pH for different forage crops. Um, pasture grasses tend to be in that 5.5 to 6 is the pH that most of our pasture grasses prefer. Um, small grains and ryegrass prefers a little bit low pH too of about 6 to 6.3. Clover about 6.5 and then alfalfa 7. So some things to think about when you look at that is if you don't have the ability to get that pH up close to 7 and you're down that 5.5 to 6 range, you're not going to have an advantage of trying to interseed alfalfa. If you need to interseed a legume into pH down around 6 to 6.5, you're going to be much better off, get more growth, more tonnage, and longer survivability out of looking at interseeding with a clover into your grass pastures or grass stands than trying to put alfalfa in. So that soil pH is 6.5 to 7. It's optimum for those nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which is what we really need for those legume crops, the clovers and alfalfas, to thrive. Um, if you look at this picture over here on the left, you see no nodules on those plants. They were pulled out of some soils that had a low pH down around six. Um, and then over here where we have the nodulation, we're in that six and a half to seven. And we see a lot of nodules, a lot of nitrogen fixing bacteria going on. Yeah, so somebody asked a question here of, um, what are those tillage options to ensure pH uniformity in the top eight inches? 
Uh, so when we look at that top eight inches, the first thing to do before you go out and do tillage to try to incorporate lime. So lime moves very slowly down through the soil profile, but using tillage that stirs, um, chisel plow and disc will get you about the top four inches. If you really have a pH problem in that top eight inches, some sort of inversion tillage, um, unfortunately, moveboard plow and planting that right away so we don't have a lot of erosion is the best way to create a uniform pH throughout that top eight inches by mixing that lime throughout. Um, one of the challenges there, of course, is if you do have hills, you're going to have erosion challenges. So you need to make sure that you put the lime on, you plant a crop to hold the hills in place as we have that heat, that lime reacts with the soil to create the pH change. Um, it's not ideal, but often it's needed if we see huge variations in pH. So some ways you can tell if you have that problem is pull different depths of soil samples. So if you pull a zero to four inch sample, and then you pull a zero to six and a zero to eight, you can get an idea of what the pH is throughout those different samples, or pull that eight inch core and split a few, few of them apart to see once how your pH changes across that depth and submit some samples to the lab where you did zero to two, two to six and six to eight or something along those lines. Just try to see how that pH is uniformly across the top eight inches. Um, you can always, if you have soils that allow you to pull deeper cores, uh, if you're gonna plant alfalfa, it doesn't hurt to occasionally pull some 12 or 16 inch samples, mostly to look at pH. Um, you don't really wanna look at nitrogen and phosphorus on those depths because we just don't have good recommendations. The next thing to look at is for good nitrogen fixation is if it's clover or alfalfa to look at using inoculants. Over here on your right was an inoculated alfalfa stand. You can see it's dark green. These have the exact same soil test, exact same pH throughout otherwise. Over here on the left, the stand was not inoculated. If we're trying to improve an older pasture or a grass stand that hasn't had any legumes grown on it for 10 years, um, really four years or better, we should look at inoculating. Um, if you have some legumes out there and you're just trying to thicken up the stand, there may be good bacteria activity that you wouldn't have to inoculate. But if the pasture is pretty much dead or the grass stands dead of legumes or you're planting a new stand, it's a good idea to inoculate to make sure you have those nitrogen fixing bacteria present. Um, nutrients and balance matter. And this is what we're going to dive into next. So if you look at the top growth here, if we just put on phosphorus and potassium to this grass crop, um, it actually looks a little bit yellowed. We don't have very good stand, but we have about the same amount as if we just put on nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, you're going to feel like I go a little bit overboard on potassium, but when it comes to potassium, it's a very important crop nutrient for forage crops. So as I start diving into potassium here in a minute, if you feel like I'm going overboard, it's because it's actually one of the nutrients I have found the most lacking across many different forage tests um, coming off of pastures, alfalfa fields and clover fields. Um, without enough potassium fertilization, we just aren't seeing the root growth and the overwintering ability. But when you look in the middle, you see a nice lush stand um, that had a balance of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium and a strong crop. So moving into potassium nutrition on, of alfalfa, um, while I'm hitting hard on alfalfa, really the potassium matters across all these crops. So when you look at root development, most lateral roots are gonna be near the soil surface for the first year, but in alfalfa and grasses, they tend to move deeper as the plants age. Um, alfalfa has a lower rooting density though than many grasses and a deeper rooting zone. With alfalfa, we can get these roots easily down to 18 inches. If you're looking at annual crops, typically the roots stop between that six to eight inch range. Um, so it's really important to make sure we have nutrients throughout for an alfalfa crop or a long-term perennial grass. Um, nutrient applications increase root growth, established roots to obtain greater moisture and nutrients from those greater volumes of surfaces, making them a much more productive crop. So there's a lot of factors that can restrict this root growth, uh, a lot of things to look into. So could, disease can damage roots. If it's a legume, poor nodulation will decrease nutrient uptake. Soil compaction. Uh, if we have that compacted layer, if we went out to fix our pH problem when the soil was too wet running that moldboard plow through and we actually created a smear pan, that change in soil density can actually create challenges for our roots to move from that eight inch depth on down into eight to 18 inches of depth because we have a major change in density and we also could have created a compaction layer there with smearing. Insect damage to the roots, temperature of the soil, 
um, nutrient deficiencies, excessive salts and sodiums, depending where you're at in the state, poor drainage, uh, low oxygen are definitely challenges that restrict rooting depth. Um, if you're in one of the areas of the state that has a very shallow water table, so sometimes you have saturated soils up to within a foot of the soil surface, uh, depending what type of crop you're chat trying to grow, that can kill those roots off and prune them back. Uh, some of the soils I'm working in will have basically a soil tape, uh, water table at basically zero inches at certain times. Some of our swamp muck soils up here, we tend to have very saturated in the spring. And depending what types of grasses we try to grow in those pastures or legumes, those roots get pruned back every spring because of how saturated our soils are. So when we look at the recovery of potassium from different soil depths, this is pretty interesting to look at on an alfalfa crop. Um, there's a study I will pull in later where they actually applied some deep placement potassium and looked at the growth and change of that alfalfa crop, but they applied from zero to 36 inches the potassium and then looked at where it was recovering it from using some different isotope staining. But what you could find is the surface, the surfaces, whoops, that's not what you guys want. Um, the surface and recovery, so 41% of potassium comes straight from that surface, those fine roots up at the surface, but we'll get about 11% of it recovered from deep down about th three feet if we have that deep rooting depth. Um, my part of the state, this 18 to 24 is about all the deeper we can keep alfalfa roots in a good year on well-drained soils with tile and not have them pruned off. We'll get about 16, 10%, so down here under 20 on these lower depths, but we're still getting potassium from down there. And that's why we can see these crops thrive in a drought year. Um, so to diagnose nutrient deficiencies, there's gonna be three things we're gonna look at, soil testing, tissue analysis, and visual observations. Uh, so when it comes to diagnosing potassium deficiency in alfalfa, one thing we have to be very careful of is that it can be easily confused with insect damage. So it's small whitish to yellowish spots first appearing around the outer edges of those older leaves. So typically lower in the plant, um, you get yellowing at the leaves can be a sign of potassium deficiency. But that yellowing can actually look very similar to insect damage. Um, so working to diagnose that uh, is important to determine, is it really a potassium deficiency or do we have an insect problem? The first step there is, I won't dive into it since we're in a nutrient presentation, but to scout for those insects and do some different methods to detect the different insect damage that you may have. So when you're looking at potassium deficiency here, moderate deficiency is going to be little small yellow spots that look like freckles, typically on the older leaves around the outer edges. Um, some of your younger leaves may have a few little spots in the middle. When we get severe deficiency, it can actually look almost like leafhopper damage. The entire plant basically looks burned off and yellow. Um, one difference here is our nutrients tend to avoid this center vein. If you look closely at this leaf, the center vein is still green, where if it was insect damage, they would have sucked the nutrients out of that center vein and even the center vein of the leaf would be yellow. So when we look at potassium concentration, uh, if we're gonna take some samples, so stems near the top of the plant contain the most potassium and then leaf concentration is similar among the lower, upper and lower leaves. So when you're taking a sample, if you're just looking at stems near the ground, uh, about 2% on a dry matter basis would be normal for potassium. Stems near the top uh, can be up to about 6% potassium. And then harvested at early bloom, entire plant, 1.8 to 2.5. So sometimes if you run, we're looking at dry matter basis. So one way to assess the potassium in your field actually is when you get back your forage test to look at what the potassium concentration is in your forage. Um, if you have really low potassium below this 1.8, 2% range, you probably have low potassium in the field. Uh, that's one of the best ways to keep track of your soil fertility. Well, a lot of times, unless you're in a really intensive production system, you may not be looking at that phosphorus and potassium on those soil or on your forage analysis, but you may have them ran. Um, if you assess those, that can actually help you determine what your fertility in your fields are. Roots, of course, contain less potassium and a crop removes about 50 pounds of K2O per ton harvested um, on a typical alfalfa crop. 
So when you're looking soil tests, you know, you need to make sure you verify that that pH is six and a half or higher uh, for efficient nitrogen fixation and potassium availability. If you're going to do a plant analysis, typically you only sample the top six inches at harvest, not that entire plant, but that entire plant in a forage test does give you an idea of what's going on on your farm. Um, less than 2% indicates insufficient potassium, which means you could have some winter hardiness issues. So if you're sampling second or third cutting and seeing low results, um, it's definitely a sign that before winter, you're going to want to do some potassium fertilization to improve winter hardiness because potassium is very important for winter root growth and survivability. Adequate potassium improves persistence, the number of shoots per plant increases, and the shoot yield, more tons per shoot. Deficiencies reduce root starch storage, so that root starch is really important for that overwintering so that the plants can come back from that starch storage and also rooting depth can be affected by low potassium. Um, reduces protein concentration in the roots, results in poor survivability, low shoot growth in the spring. Uh, you'll definitely see differences in stand between fertilized and unfertilized fields. Nodule amounts, so the amount of nitrogen we can produce is affected by potassium fertilization. So down here across the bottom is the pounds of K2O added, so from zero to 107 pounds and the nodule numbers. So without putting any potassium on, we're about 45. 107 pounds of K2O takes us up to about 60 nodules. So there's a significant difference there and a significant difference in weight, about 35 to 65 milligrams for nodules. The more nodules we have, the more nitrogen we can produce. Plant counts also change. This is a multi-year study. Yes, it's very old, um, but some of this good information doesn't change with time, even if it is 40 years old. Um, maybe some of it could be redone, but we still see very similar trends in production fields today. So without potassium applied, and then the blue bars, there was only 100 pounds of potassium, K2O, applied per year. For a good alfalfa stand here in Ohio, um, our recommendation is usually to apply about 300 pounds. So they, it, but back in 77, 71 to 77, they weren't growing as many tons, so you didn't need to put on as much. But as you look at stand density, um, we're running a little under 100%, so about 95%. From 71 all the way through seven years on this stand to 77 by applying potassium every year. We didn't apply any potassium to the stand. It went on a steady decline from 100% density down to 25, eh, you're about 18% density seven years later in 77. Massive stand losses, it would have been filled in, of course, by weeds and volunteer grasses that we didn't want. So a drastic change in that field's productivity and quality just by not applying potassium and keeping everything else the same. Um, when alfalfa is in a mixed stand, you're gonna see the largest where soil fertility levels are low, you're gonna see a large response to potassium fertilization. Oops, went one too many clicks. Um, you need it to meet alfalfa needs in that mixed stand. So if we're gonna put on potassium, we need to meet those alfalfa needs on crop removal. We need to keep that fertilized about 120 to 140 parts per million. And we see an increase in quality. So you go back to that nodulation. We need those nodules of the alfalfa crop or the clover crop to produce the nitrogen for our grass crop. So the more legume to grass we have, of course, the more protein is gonna be in that stand. A little summary here on potassium. Um, alfalfa takes up and removes large amounts of potassium from the soil. Typically, we don't wanna apply more than 300 pounds of potassium per year. Applications over that can actually cause salting burn out in the field. Fertilization is essential for high yield, stand longevity, winter hardiness. Um, fertilize to optimize forage yields. Check your test for two to 3% potassium. Um, applications pre-plant and then following harvest, looking at doing a fall application. Um, it is recommended that you don't do a potassium application in early spring. Um, if you're doing some spring green up applications on fields, you wanna avoid putting potassium on because you can actually see luxury consumption which ends up with very high potassium spring forages. So moving into phosphorus, uh, again, focusing on alfalfa, but a lot of this applies to grasses also. Um, phosphorus boosts yields, recovery, and quality of these crops, improves root development, and it's required for balanced nutrition. Um, when we look at the U.S. yields, we see an upwards trend all the way from the 70s into 
Um, this graph goes through about 2010 for a national yield from under three ton and now we're up to about three and a half. Doesn't look great, but that's a national yield trend and they're looking at all different types of alfalfa management systems. Um, Well-managed systems around the state are in that seven to eight ton range on average today. And we look at alfalfa uptake and removal. So an alfalfa crop will take up about and remove about 12 pounds of P205, 49 to 50 pounds of K2O, 30 pounds of calcium, six pounds of magnesium, six pounds of sulfur, and through nitrogen fixation, about 30, 60 pounds of nitrogen. Now, there's a lot of phosphorus in your soils, but very little of it's available. One challenge with phosphorus is that it doesn't have the ability to move through soils like some other nutrients and to be absorbed into the roots. That's actually one of the reasons. So when soils are cooler, phosphorus doesn't move as well. Um, so in cool soils, there's slower nutrient release from the soil organic matter, reduced diffusion of nutrients into the roots, uh, hinders root absorption and translocation. So when you go back to the tri-state nutrient recommendations for an alfalfa crop, um, a forage pasture, or a small grain crop, anything that overwinters, we actually have a higher potassium requirement of about 25 parts per million instead of 15 parts per million. Um, that's actually back in the old Bray P. I should update that for you guys into Malik. Um, so the new is about 30 parts per million without looking it up for alfalfa and small grains in the Malik testing system. Um, the reason for that is our nutrients are not as plant available in cool soils. So when our crop is trying to green up in the spring, there's less phosphorus available, but it's essential uh, for a strong root system and plant growth and vigor in the spring. So we actually need a little bit higher concentrations in our soils so that our crops take off and grow well in those cool spring soils and late into the fall. When our other agronomic crops such as corn and soybeans wouldn't even be able to germinate yet. Um, phosphorus in plants, it's very important. It's that energy currency. If you go way back to chemistry, I know nobody really wants to go back that far, but ATP is what moves energy throughout the plant. It requires phosphorus. It's a structural compound. Um, it's actually part of transferring genetic code, but really it's important for root growth and rapid recovery after grazing and harvest. Phosphorus is also pretty darn important for that nodulation. So going back to getting our alfalfa crop to produce nitrogen, looking at soil pH from 10 to 21, we see the number of nodules. Um, these are different water holding capacity soils. So 75% water holding capacity soil. We actually double that from a little under 50 to almost 100 nodules per plant. Um, up here at the higher water holding capacities, you don't see that doubling, but still we're increasing it uh, at 100%, almost 50 um, nodules per plant, so we can produce more nitrogen. And we look at the amount of nodules available to produce those nitrogen. Phosphorus, again, is absolutely critical. To look at what you really care about here, recovery of the plant. So shoots per plant on different phosphorus concentrations. The red line down here is zero shoots or zero phosphorus, and then the green line is um, two times or at typical concentration of a good phosphorus application. And you can see we go from about two shoots per plant to right around five shoots per plant. So we get a lot better shoot regrowth by putting phosphorus on our crop. When we look at some different frequencies and timings here, there's a lot of questions of how often do you need to fertilize? So we're looking at a six year stand. We're gonna remove about hundred pounds every year in this study. Um, hundred pounds of P205 is applied every year as one treatment. Another treatment applies 200 pounds every two years. And the last treatment applies 600 pounds as a one-time application pre-plant incorporated. Um, so there's the same amount of phosphorus applied in total to these treatments over all six years. Um, this study actually looks at banding versus broadcasting. So when we look at this, so in year one, this is alfalfa year yield above a check. So the amount of yield increase over no phosphorus applied at all, 100 pounds per year in year one versus year six. We can see that in year six, we get a lot higher yields, but 100 versus 200 pounds. So applying on a yearly versus every other year application, we really don't see a difference. So if you're having to go out and pay somebody to come apply that phosphorus, um, soil, uh, retention wise, water quality wise, there may be some advantages to only applying 100 pounds 
but for our crop, we can apply 200 pounds every other year and get the same effect as a yearly application of 100 pounds of P2O5. But you don't want to go out, if you look over here where my highlighter is, and put on all 600 pounds that first year. So we did see a massive yield increase in year one, but by the end of the study at six years, uh, a lot of that phosphorus was either removed through luxury consumption or leached and lost out of our system because we did not see the same yield increase by year six of the study. Uh, we were back there at about a flat baseline, two or 3% increase. There still was an advantage to phosphorus fertilization, but nowhere near as much as if we had applied a small amount every year or every other year. And we also probably created some water quality challenges by applying that 600 pounds in one shot. To look over the entire six years of the study, this is the part that's kind of interesting, um, that cumulative yield response in tons here. So 100 pounds per year, about 3.4 additional tons over the check, 200 pounds every two years, not statistically different, but there was a numerical advantage, 4.2 pounds. Um, while we did get that yield bump in year one, two, and three, by year five, six, and we we're seeing that decline. We did see an advantage to that 600 pounds all at once, but it's still not a recommended practice. The interesting thing on this slide was some deep placement work. So when they looked at placing that phosphorus six inches deep in the soil, um, which we could potentially do with some form of tillage easily if tillage works in your system, um, or if you have some way to get a hold of strip till equipment or some sort of phosphorus placement tool that gets it in six to eight inches, they were actually seeing a major yield advantage by deep placing phosphorus into the soil. A lot of that came, there was a dry year in the study and they saw a lot more plant growth on the deep placed phosphorus that year versus where they had the phosphorus just spread on top. Um, of course, deep placement really needs to happen prior to planting. Um, there are a few tools available that may let you get in that four to six inches, um, some high speed no-till tools in season into a crop, but there you're risking cutting off alpha crowns. So there's some risk with trying to place phosphorus deep in season. Established stands often need additional phosphorus, especially if you're trying to get six or seven years out of a stand. So you definitely want a soil test every three or four years. Um, if there's a way to incorporate, that's always best, but we do have that green growing crop out there. So if we place spread phosphorus on top, it's definitely gonna help hold it in place. Um, phosphorus moves down through our soils using freeze thaw sweat cycles and also washes down in with rainfall applicate with rainfall events. Um, failure to replace the harvested nutrients leads to that gradual depletion of soil nutrient supply and is going to reduce yield. So you go to this study here, did an annual application. If we look at the check, you see over time the soil test levels decline, but basically no matter what nutrient you use, um, you can actually build those soils if you're over applying for what you're actually removing but we can build soils with any one of those phosphorus sources, but we see that decline if we're just removing crop and not replacing phosphorus. Preparing soils before planting is definitely key. Prior to planting, you can incorporate that phosphorus for establishment for strong root systems, promoting rapid growth and recovery, maintaining healthy stands, uh, providing balanced nutrients, make sure we also have adequate potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, boron out there, and we don't have those differences. Um, in this picture, you can look, see the guy standing out in the field holding his papers. He has two different treatments, low phosphorus versus adequate phosphorus. And you can see looking at him, the low phosphorus is still there. It looks like he's got a good stand. It's almost waist high, but over here in the adequate stand, um, it's about mid chest height. So there's a lot better stand over there where there's ad adequate phosphorus present. You can't just choose to utilize one nutrient. It's important to balance that phosphorus and potassium nutrition. Uh, it's essential for optimum yields and stand maintenance. If we look back here at this graph, so no phosphorus and potassium applied, potassium only, phosphorus only, and then your green bar is phosphorus and potassium. And you can see every year where both nutrients were applied, that's where we maximized yield. And if you look over here at the roots, where we have adequate phosphorus and potassium, we see a much stronger taproot that's gonna be available to survive winter better. You see more branching roots coming off to help hold that plant into the ground and to go out and scavenge for nutrients. Um, this was another study, this one actually came from Purdue where they looked at some different fertilization strategies. Zero potassium, 75 
phosphorus, 200 potassium, 50 phosphorus, 300 potassium, zero phosphorus, 400 potassium, zero phosphorus. So what you can notice from this study, one is an obvious color difference. Um, the more potassium we applied, it's a greener crop. It actually produces more nitrogen, higher crude protein, but more tonnage is back here in the back. While it's yellow, you see more height than that plant when phosphorus was applied. Uh, diagnosis of phosphorus deficiencies, visual observations, um, distinct phosphorus deficiencies are seldom observed. Um, if you do see it, it's gonna be purpling. Soil testing is the best way to find phosphorus challenges and deficiencies. Tissue analysis is another way, uh, the best way to monitor plant performance. Um, if you're gonna do a tissue analysis, a quarter to 0.4% um, phosphorus in the top third of the plant would be considered adequate. Uh, manure is also an excellent source. Um, this was a study that was looking at utilizing manure uh, that was high in phosphorus and comparing that to none and low phosphorus. And we can see a definite yield advantage to putting manure on that field to get the phosphorus, potassium and all the good nutrients that come out of manure. So if you have confinement and cattle operation, you can put that back on your hay fields. Um, there's a few things to be concerned about with manures as your fertilizer source. Um, most of those are uh, diseases that can pass from manure back to animals. So if you're going to do that, um, the best time to apply manure is after your last cutting in the fall. Apply that manure so that it has time to break down and for those diseases to win or kill. Um, otherwise, say you apply after first cutting, and some of that manure gets picked up by your harvest equipment, you can actually be feeding manure back to those animals in your forage. A little review here of what the crop nutrient removal is. Cool season grasses will remove about 40 pounds of nitrogen a ton, 13 pounds of P2O5, 50 pounds of potassium, five pounds of sulfur. Alfalfa, nine pounds of nitrogen, three pounds of phosphorus, eight pounds of potassium, one and a half pounds of sulfur. Alfalfa, anywhere from about 49 to 60 pounds of nitrogen, 12 pounds of phosphorus, 50 pounds of potassium, six pounds of sulfur, and 0 0.08 pounds of boron. Um, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about boron fertilization. It can be a needed nutrient, but it can be a toxic, toxic environment if you put too much on. Uh, forage nutrients, sulfur, boron, and zinc, diving in here into the microbes. So soil testing for sulfur and micronutrients is not reliable. Um, generally, the use of plant tissue analysis is what's going to be the best option to look at these three nutrients. So sampling alfalfa or grasses, um, generally we're going to sample the top in six inches of alfalfa. Grasses, we're going to sample five weeks post-harvest before flowering initiation. And what we're going to sample there is the uppermost leaf. Um, sulfurs, generally possible deficiencies in low organic matter soils, sandy soils, um, and soils without manure additions. And we're seeing more and more sulfur deficiencies across the state. Boron's pretty much reserved for alfalfa has a relatively high requirement um, and grasses have a low requirement for boron. Other legumes are gonna fall in between. So clovers need more than grass, but less than alfalfa. And typically you don't have a problem in clovers. Um, deficiencies can be possible in grasses on sandy soils and low organic matter soils. Zinc, typically we don't see zinc deficiencies in forage crops in Ohio. Uh, the only place I see it actually locally, we've seen some zinc deficiencies. There's some muck ground locally that can be a challenge. It ties up zinc and it's not available. So we're looking at sufficiency ranges for sulfur on a dry matter concentration, about a quarter of a percent dry matter, or that's of the entire plant, or if we're sampling the upper third, a quarter to a half a percent in that top third <clears throat> when it's sampled between bud and one tenth bloom, so high quality. Alfalfa, 30 to 80 parts per million is that sufficiency range, actually at 100 parts per million. If alfalfa uptakes 100 parts per million of boron, it can actually become toxic to that plant and start to kill it. Clover, 20 parts per million. Grasses, 5 to 10 parts per million is considered sufficient. Zinc, alfalfa is 20 to 70 parts per million, grasses 20 to 50 parts per million sufficient for zinc and a tissue test. Um, do we need to give more attention to sulfur? I'm gonna say yes, definitely. The Clean Air Act has resulted in lower sulfur emissions, lower sulfur depositions on fields through rainfall. Uh, using fertilizers, most of them contain little to no sulfur unless you're choosing 
um, a nitrogen source such as ammonium sulfate that contains sulfur. Higher forage yields remove more sulfur than what we're applying through acid rain. Um, and all factors increase that likelihood of a positive forage response to sulfur. So if we go back just 31 years to 1989, and we look here at Ohio, uh, and we look at total um, sulfate deposition, we're somewhere here, these are different scales, so that's important to realize. Um, one, we're looking at total sulfur, the other one we're looking at sulfate. Um, so it'd be a lot higher, but back in 1989, we were dark red we had a lot of sulfur deposition. We were applying more through atmospheric deposition than what we're removing in our crop. Today, Ohio still is one of the more, the areas of the country that has more sulfur deposition, but we're a light green. Um, the color scales on these two kind of relate to each other. So if it's uh, that light bluish green, that's really low deposition. Dark red would be high deposition. We don't see any dark red. We're in a little bit of yellow, uh, just off the top of my pointer here, over in Northeast Ohio. So that's gonna be down here. If you're in that yellow area, you're probably getting sufficient sulfur. But as we move into the greens and into the blues, uh, you're not getting sufficient sulfur deposition anymore for some of our crops, especially alfalfa. Um, our grass crops may be getting enough, but you may start to see a sulfur response in alfalfa. Uh, the sulfur deficiencies in plants, they're gonna be weak and spindly. They have that yellow tinge to them, almost looks like an insect problem, a lot lower tonnage and regrowth. Uh, growers should be aware of that increasing potential, especially on low organic matter soils. Um, organic matter helps to tie up sulfur that falls as atmospheric deposition through the winter. Um, if we have low organic matter soils, that's not bound up in our soils. So testing for sulfur deficiency, uh, typically we need to use that tissue test, you're going to pull 40 to 50 random plants, harvesting that top six inches, send them in and test those and see once if you're in that about quarter percent sulfur for that plant tissue. Uh, there's a lot of different sources available. If we're using a nitrogen fertilizer on these crops, putting in a little ammonium sulfate is perfectly fine. Um, we'll look at a study here that looked at gypsum. Livestock manure also has some sulfur in it. If you're doing a fall Potassium application to alfalfa, elemental sulfur might be your best source for an alfalfa crop, where ammonium sulfate is probably the source you wanna look at for a grass crop. Um, and conditions have changed a lot since this study. Um, the conditions that have changed is we're getting even less sulfur. But an Ohio study done from 2009 to 2012 compared the response of elemental sulfur, flue gas, gypsum, and reduced rates of potassium and phosphorus to look at uh, yields and how sulfur and those nutrient applications affected the crop. Now, this is just a little summary of what was applied. So you, they had none tri-state uh, P and K at crop removal, 50% P and K, tri-state plus flue gas, gypsum, sulfur, and elemental sulfur. So <clears throat> one thing to note, the ability they had to apply this flue gas, gypsum, they put way too much sulfur on. Um, 250 pounds of sulfur was applied in the flue gas, gypsum, which was per acre, which was way more than what that crop would have needed. This elemental sulfur down here at more like 75 is more where they should have been, but their equipment wouldn't spread it that low. Um, so one challenge there is at that really high rate of gypsum, they actually pushed this alfalfa crop almost to the point of sulfur toxicity. Um, but hey, it still showed a massive yield response um, over no fertilization. So if we just followed tri-state, we got six tons versus four and a half tons without fertilizer. Um, and then at crop removal, 5.8 tons, 50% crop removal, 5.5 tons. So not a lot of difference here, uh, but we did see that significant yield increase. Even bigger yield bump when we added sulfur in. So using gypsum, um, you didn't see quite the same, but statistically it's the same yield. Six and a half in gypsum, 6.7 for the elemental sulfur. So we picked up about a half a ton. Um, and as our atmospheric deposition continues to decrease, uh, you're seeing even greater advantages to adding sulfur. Um, this study was done in West Central Ohio at the Western Research Station. Uh, in 2013, same study, but no additional fertilizer was added. Um, four cuttings this year, three and a half ton on the no fertilizer applied. When we had sulfur applied, 22 or 7%, 17% increase by having that sulfur applied 
over the tri-state level. Um, so saw a major advantage there. Over a ton in 2013 was gained by just applying sulfur on top of the regular nutrient program. When we look at the amount of sulfur content, this is where it gets a little bit sticky. We're getting pretty high here, but if it's blended into a ration, um, you would be okay. This concentration of sulfur over 0.3 is a little bit hot for most of our livestock, but typically blended in with other feeds, you wouldn't notice. Um, protein content, saw some advantages here to the sulfur application. Um, almost every year to an increase in crude protein of two to 3%. Um, actually, just that increase in crude protein, if you would get the same yield, was paying for it with the value of protein. So study summary, uh, gypsum and elemental sulfur increased the sulfur content in soil and in the harvested forages. Alfalfa yield increased eight to 9% over the lifetime of the stand. Crude protein increased by about two percentage points over the lifetime of the stand. Uh, marginal returns were highest for treatments containing sulfur as elemental and flue gas gypsum. Yield response to gypsum was likely due to the sulfur. Uh, while there was calcium that's part of gypsum, that increase in calcium content was not speculated to have increased forage yield and soil pH was not affected by the calcium in the gypsum. So diving into boron here as our last nutrient. So boron, um, I call it an essential-ish nutrient. It's important, but it's a challenging one. So soil levels of one part per million for alfalfa or a half a part per million for other forages if you try to soil test for it. But soil testing is really not the recommended way to determine if boron's needed tissue testing. Uh, is a better way. Um, you can, it can easily become toxic. So when in your soils get close to one part per million or your tissue gets close to one part per million in that upper third, um, typically we wanna see about 30 parts per million. At hundred parts per million in tissue, it becomes toxic to alfalfa, lower levels for grasses. Annual application rates not to exceed two pounds per acre can improve yields in deficient soils. So we're looking at two pounds per acre uh, you have to work with a fertilizer company that does a very good job of blending that into your other fertilizer mix or uses some sort of liquid boron if you're trying to put on a really low rate. Um, if you think about two pounds per acre, that is um, less than the weight of that bag of sugar that you have in your kitchen. Um, those applications over two pounds can become toxic. I actually saw a situation this year, uh, while this isn't a current photo, where Somebody made a small mistake in their calculations and they applied 10 pounds of boron per acre instead of two pounds of boron. Um, it was a challenge of reading the concentration of the boron product in the bag. They got in a pallet of a different concentration than what the fertilizer company was used to using. They put in the same number of pounds as what they normally did, but it was a more concentrated product. And at that 10 pounds of boron per acre, we could see some toxicity signs in alfalfa. So what they look like, um, you get this very white color on the alfalfa plants. It can start out as just a little halo ring. Um, if we look at these plants, they're small. We see a few that are down here that have actually died off. Uh, you can't see it really well, at least not in my lighting, but there's a white halo ring around quite a few of these leaves. Um, that's a sign of boron toxicity that can be found when 10 pounds of boron are applied per acre. Fescue can have the same challenges. Uh, fescue toxicity to boron can easily set in at 10 pounds per acre. Um, this leaf here, you can see it's got a white tip. There's a white tip up here. If you look really close, quite a few of the tips of these leaves are white. Uh, there's also a few dead plants in there. The orchard grass shows it probably the best. Again, 10 pounds applied. We have these white tips on the orchard grass. That's usually the sign of boron toxicity is it's a bleached white tip or a bleached white ring. In grasses, it's the tip. In legumes, it's a ring around the outside of the leaf. Timothy, again, shows those same type of symptoms, uh, white tips. Moving into nitrogen here to finish off. Um, alfalfa uses the nitrogen that is provided, whether we provide nitrogen or it has to fix it, that's where it gets its nitrogen from. The, if we apply nitrogen, it gets lazy. It doesn't fix as much. If no nitrogen is applied, it works hard and it fixes nitrogen. Grass forage, on the other hand, needs nitrogen fertilization. So some things to think about, are you managing your grass as a pasture or a forage grass? 
So if it's a pasture, about 80% of nitrogen in pastures is returned through the urine and feces of our livestock. So we don't have to apply as much nitrogen to our pastures. High stocking rates with high densities and short amounts of time do a better job of distributing and returning the nitrogen that our animals consume back to the pasture evenly across the whole pasture. Um, in nitrogen pas in pastures, nitrogen fertilization is only needed uh, if you utilize some of that grass for forage or a small amount of fertilization to improve the summer slump. So here we're looking at average yields over three years uh, for four different nitrogen treatments. So you have no nitrogen and there's about a one ton, 100 pounds of nitrogen in the spring, two ton yield, 100 pounds of nitrogen in October, and then 100 pounds in June, you're looking at about a three ton yield. And then when you pushed it even harder with 150 pounds in spring and June, you got about three tons. So still about the same as 100 pounds. So it really wasn't an advantage to that extra 50 pounds on each, each application. Basically seeing a similar trend on some on-farm research, zero, about three quarters of a ton of grass yield, 100 pounds, one and a half tons, 200 pounds total and two split application, about two and a quarter. Some big things to see here is the differences not in May yield. Yes, there's a difference. I guess there's a huge difference. Um, you gained about two thirds of a ton, but we start also managing to fill in by putting on this nitrogen application. So if we do a hundred pounds, we see about a ton here. But if we come back and do this extra hundred pounds in June and July, we see an additional quarter ton each month during the summer slump, so June, July, and August, that we wouldn't see if we hadn't put on that nitrogen fertilization. Uh, nitrogen rates by species, uh, you see a lot of the similar trends here. Zero pounds, 1.3, 100 pounds in reed canary grass, 3.7, 5.6 tons at 200 pounds. Um, orchard grass has a very similar response. One ton with zero, 3.7 with 100 pounds, and, <coughs> and six tons of a 200. Our legumes, they have a major advantage. Um, this is why if we're growing pastures, especially, we like to look at ways we can incorporate <clears throat> legumes into our stand. So are those legumes that are fixing nitrogen, almost a five ton yield with the legumes that are in there, uh, 200 pounds of nitrogen applied onto those grasses, only four tons. So this was a grass field that had smooth, blown, smooth brome grass and quack grass in it. It was improved with alfalfa and curra clover that was interseeded in, in <clears throat> that produced that nitrogen and really improved that yield. So some different strategies to look at um, on pastures, 50 to 75 pounds of nitrogen would be the amount to look at. Uh, one application mid-June to improve the summer slump is probably the place to start if you're gonna look at 50 pounds of nitrogen. If you're going over 50, if you're up there in that 75 or you want to try to push it a little bit higher into 100 pounds of nitrogen, uh, looking at split applications. Um, mid to early June and then mid to late July would be those two application timings. Um, that would be the most advantageous for pastures. Hay fields, on the other hand, they're going to need a little bit more nitrogen, 75 to 150 pounds of nitrogen. Um, when you think about it, how many tons are you removing? So a three ton grass crop at 12 and percent crude protein removes 120 pounds of nitrogen. Um, some of that nitrogen could come from the soil, but a lot of it needs to come from our additional nitrogen that we're adding, whether it's from manure or synthetic fertilizers. If we're removing three and three quarters tons at that same 12 and percent crude protein, we're removing 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But if you're looking at putting on 150 pounds of nitrogen, you probably need to look at a uh, Three-prong fertilizer strategy, applying some in the spring, mid-June and mid-July, especially if you're in a forage situation um, and you're trying to take three cuttings. So spring green up and then after each cutting going back and applying nitrogen fertilizer at about 50 pounds per application. Uh, if you're using urea, uh, about 100 pounds of urea, possibly mixing in some ammonium sulfate with that, you get a sulfur source and putting a little on each time. Um, if any of this nutrient information intrigues you and you're looking at how to improve your operation, you can't really determine uh, what to do, how much to put on. You know, we went over different soil tests, how much is removed, but you're trying to figure out, will it have an advantage to me? Uh, go ahead and test it yourself. 
Um, testing fertilizer protocols is fairly simple. You just pick areas that you don't apply to. Ideally, you treat at least three sections, three blocks and leave three untreated. Um, go out and take samples from that, ideally four samples using some sort of standardized square. If you have, take some PVC pipe, make a 25 by 25 square. Uh, you take that times um, 10,000 and that gives you pounds per acre. That's why I recommend 25 by 25. Or you can use some sort of rising plate meter or stick to measure the tonnage that's coming from your pastures or your hay fields. Ideally, you'd submit a forage test to see if you improve crude, crude protein. Um, but that's more expensive. You can at least investigate relatively cheaply. Advantages to yield by either improving pH, phosphorus, potassium programs, or if you're in a grass system, adding nitrogen into your system. Um, if testing yourself sounds fun but complicated, any extension educator around the state will gladly help you with that. Uh, do we have any questions? I about used up all my time. to. Hey, Jason, as we switch over to Christine's presentation, uh, question in the chat. As we look at grasses and your slide where you had the different pH and toxicity of different nutrients, um, if we got a pH that's really low and forages that are exhibiting some of those toxic levels, what's the quickest way to rem remedy that? Uh, you can't, whoops, I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, so you can't move the animals off. Um, the quickest way, I mean, we can start to remedy it with fertilizer applications and liming. Um, but really, if we can't move them off pasture, the best thing to do is, unfortunately, to mix in some haze and different feeds uh, to decrease the content that they're eating. So we can, if we feed some lower concentration feeds, we decrease the total ration concentration of whatever that toxic element was. Um, we can balance that out and still allow them to eat some of that pasture that may be up there in that toxic level. Um, but um, not make our animals sick. So basically we're diluting it by trying to mix in some other forage sources. And I think you touched on it a bit and there's a question in the QA, um, tillage options, you know, to homogenize that top eight inch level. Yeah, um, tillage options, it really, you know, the most homogenizing tool we still have available on the farm. If you got big enough, horse and enough diesel fuel and one that was built heavy enough 60 years ago when they were building lots of moldboard plows. I've sunk them in about 10 inches deep to do some homogenization. That's going to be your best tillage option. Um, beyond that, if you're looking to homogenize and mix things in, uh, chisel plow, while it may be able to pull up a sliver and kind of mix in, really you're looking at a disc that's mixing that top four inches. Um, some other options in my area uh, we have some strip till rigs that are used to strip till into corn and some deep uh, tillage tools that we've seen outfitted with different fertilizer carts and things that'll go in. Um, ideally, you don't want to pull those in my area much deeper than about 15 inches. We have some fields at about 10. You start finding tile. That's always fun. Um, but some of those set up to place nutrients deep. Um, I've seen guys go through pastures with a no-till inline ripper pulling a fertilizer cart, you basically can't tell it ran through and put nutrients in deep in a grass pasture. Uh, that's one option. Um, the strip till rigs tend to do more soil disturbance, would have to be done before you plant. I don't like doing any of that in hay fields just because it makes it rough, but it is a possibility for pastures. Um, hay fields, it just about has to be done ahead of time, whether you're going through deep and placing those nutrients with some sort of deep tillage tool or mow board plowing just highly encourage if you mow board plow to work it down and plant something so the hills and valleys don't all wash away. And just real quick before Christine starts, uh, P and K recommendations for alfalfa. Uh, how do they apply to clovers? How do they apply to clovers? So clovers remove just a little bit less. I mean, they remove a little bit less. So on alfalfa, you're moving about I should pull that slide up, but it's, I know it's 50 pounds of potassium. You're removing 35 to 40 on clovers and phosphorus, it's 12 to 15 pounds of P2O5 a ton. You're moving a little less. You could probably use 12 for clovers. Um, so, but your soil tests need to be very similar. Thank you, Jason.